Let's start the evening with an invocation by Dr. Rick Martinez, Department Chair for Management and Marketing in the School of Business. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that we're able to come together this evening at a great institution uh, among great people, great students, and Lord, we praise you that um, you put, put people in our midst to help us learn, to teach us. Uh, we thank you that uh, Mr. Weekly has given his time this evening to help us know about the, the challenges he's had and the victories he's had and, and uh, the, the things that he's learned. And Heavenly Father, we, uh, we just praise you that um, we are at a place of learning. We're, we're at a place where our learning is worship. And Lord, we ask that you'll bless our time together tonight. We ask that you'll uh, bless the lessons that we're going to hear and uh, give us great fellowship. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let me now request Dr. Robert Sloan, president of HBU, to come up and say a few words. <laughs> it's okay, thank you. Thank you, your applause is very kind. Welcome to uh, this wonderful event tonight. I know we have a number, 30 or 40 uh, guests of the university who are here tonight, and so we welcome you to the Brown Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, if you look at your program, you will see not only do we have a, an outstanding lecturer this evening, but we have a wonderful history of uh, outstanding business leaders and uh, academics and others who've made presentations uh, to the university. And so I know from uh, Mr. Weekly's reputation and also from the brief time he and I have had to visit already, and we have some mutual friends, that he is an, an outstanding person. I've heard him speak before, and I can tell you that you're, you're in for a, a treat. Uh, to have both uh, your heart and your mind challenged. So welcome to the university. Uh, we're glad you're on our campus. If you're new to uh, HBU, we invite you to look around the campus when you have the opportunity. We, we have a beautiful university. We're about 52 years old. And uh, I think you'll find not only that the surroundings uh, are outstanding, the landscaping beautiful, but uh, the more you get to know us, you'll know of our distinctive mission, our clear identity. Uh, that we are seeking to be a comprehensive national university that is uh, distinctively and unapologetically committed to Jesus Christ. And we seek to work out the implications of the lordship of Jesus Christ in all uh, that we do as an institution of higher learning. Uh, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're on the campus. So welcome to our guest this evening. And uh, Mohan Karuvala, the dean of our School of Business, will, will introduce our guest this evening, David Weekly. Thank you, Dr. Sloan. <clears throat> but first, let me add my words of welcome to our guests and alums who are here. Always nice to see familiar faces back on campus. Uh, these are exciting times for HBU. You might have read in the media that we are starting a football team, uh, new programs, including new graduate programs. So please keep in touch and be a part of this exciting journey. Uh, so I'm, all, I'm glad that you're all here tonight. I want to thank Mr. Doug German, who has helped me put this event together. Uh, Doug is an adjunct professor in the School of Business. Uh, he teaches leadership, and he's written a book called Leadership, leadership for Life. Uh, and Doug is going to be doing the interview with Mr. David Beakley. This is a new format for the Brown Lecture this year. It's called a conversation rather than a lecture. Thank you, Doug, for doing this. And Mr. David Beakley needs no introduction. If you drive down 59, you would have seen the billboard outside uh, 59 just past, I mean, just before Fondren coming in from downtown. Very familiar name. And there's a detailed bio in the program. But what I want to tell you is a couple of things about him, which is not in the bio. He started this company when he was 23 years old without a whole lot of money in his pocket. And today, the company is the third largest privately owned home builder in this country. That's a phenomenal success story. The spirit of entrepreneurship is right there. David Weekly Homes is also listed as the seventh 
best company to work for when Fortune brought out the list of the 100 best places to work in this country. And he's involved in many philanthropic activities in Houston, including the Boy Scouts. And one of the interesting things I learned last night was that he, he interviews every employee he, not he personally, but his company, interviews every employee and their family before making a job offer. That was something new which I learned last night. So you're in for a treat. So let me welcome David and Doug. And thank you, David, for doing this. Thank you, Dr. Sloan and Dr. Carulla, for your opening remarks, and thank you, Dr. Martinez, for your beautiful prayer. Uh, I welcome you also to the beautiful Beelan Chapel in our conversation with David Weekly. Uh, and David, a special welcome to you. Thank you. For volunteering your time and to talk to us about your wisdom and insights on leadership, life, and business. And I know you've been, of course, involved in all that. I have a great passion for the topic of leadership, and Mohan mentioned I had written a book uh, regarding it. So it's a particular exciting honor for me to be able to converse with, with David Weekly, who I admire as an outstanding leader. And if you've read his bio, it's obvious that uh, he's done a great many things for, for the city of Houston and, uh, and also built a great company. Some other things that aren't in your bio, David, uh, he has an extreme form of generosity, and I think maybe we'll touch on that when we get into the conversation. Uh, and you wrote a book. I wanted to be an author like you. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> How to Buy a Home Without Being Hammered. <laughs> and I, I, thought, I thought that was pretty clever. And it's still available on Amazon. So if you want to look that up, uh, you could do that. It's, it's number 2,366,000 in, in the Amazon list of books. Well, that's right ahead of mine. Too, <laughs> so you know, we're OK. Uh, we may even talk a little bit about why. I don't know, but we'll see if we get there. Uh, at the conclusion of our conversation, uh, for 20 or 30 minutes, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask uh, Mr. Weekly questions. So you might be thinking about that. And I know you're really going to enjoy his remarks and uh, his conversation with us this, this evening. So as they say, you should probably should start at the beginning. And so I'm going to ask you a little bit about, you know, we're all products of our history. And so you probably had a lot of things happen during your formative years that may have influenced your values and how you looked at life and what you plan to do. And could you say a little bit about your early life? Early life, I, I had the great good fortune to be brought up right here in Houston, Texas, out in the Memorial area, uh, with an Ozzie and Harriet, Harriet kind of upbringing with a dad that worked and a mom at home, and I was the third of three boys, and Eagle Scout, and, and you know, growing up and just kind of a, a normal childhood, and then went to college and played harder than I should have. I, I, I did have a, uh, I was involved in Young Life in high school, which is a Christian high school, uh, uh, parachurch ministry and had a mountaintop experience there and uh, then went off to college and forgot it all and and uh, <laughs> and, and and then uh, it, it was interesting as I graduated from school I I went and uh, had gotten a graduate offer from a Northeastern University and they said we want you to work a couple of years before you uh, come up here because to get an MBA without having some <clears throat> job experience sometimes you're not quite as is useful in, in, in either the classroom or in, in jobs afterwards. So I just happened to go to work for a company called General Homes back then because they had a management training program and you know, I had an economics and geology degree so I had no ideas about getting into the home building business. But uh, went to work for them and did pretty well and, and uh, all of a sudden after about a year in this management training program I was uh, running a community and salespeople and builders and had a big bonus program and I was all excited and and about halfway through that second year, they changed the bonus program on me. And they said, you know, instead of get, giving you this big bonus, we want to give you a company car. I said, I don't really want a company car. I want, you know, I want the bonus. <laughs> and, uh, and so I talked to my boss, and I talked to my boss's boss, and they weren't listening to me. So finally, I wrote, wrote a letter to the president of the company and explained to them that I thought they were wrong. And I don't know if I used unethical in the letter or not. I forget. But uh, anyway, he called me in a little bit later, and he decided to fire me. <laughs> so, so, uh, so big mistake. Yeah. So, so, so my the first time God kind of knocked me off my horse was at age 
22 and a half uh, when I got fired yeah. from my company. And then, then my older brother said, let's start a home building business. And uh, we did. And he believed me when I came home from, uh, and told him that I was the best home builder in the country. And he, he believed the story. And so <laughs> he put his net worth on the line. We started the company. And fortunately, it was the late 70s. And it, it was easy to be a success in business at that a time. A good time. So, so you don't need a Harvard MBA to be successful? I didn't need a Harvard MBA to yeah, be successful. It was Harvard, at, by the way. Uh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't need that after, after all. So anyway. <laughs> Well, you were only 23, and to start a company at that age is pretty spectacular in and of itself. And you became uh, successful as well. What were the surprises you learned or the things that were the, probably lessons the, the, that were part of that early management leadership career? Probably the biggest surprise was when I would ask somebody to do something, they wouldn't necessarily do it right away. Uh, I mean, I was, I, it just amazed me that, that, that I'd ask someone to do something and they wouldn't just jump to it. And, uh, you know, starting out as a career uh, in my early 20s, it was really all about me. It was kind of all about David being successful. I mean, that, that was my goal in life was to make a lot of money, right? That, that was kind of my, my, my golden uh, goal out there was to, to make a lot of money. And I, I remember I, I built the company up through the late 70s and early 80s. And by 1983, I was about 29 years old, I was building a 10,000 square foot home out in the memorial area, a million dollar house. I was a millionaire and the market went in the tank. And I lost the house, I almost lost the company. This was the second time God kind of knocked, knocked me upside the head and said, David, it's not about you. You, you, you kind of misunderstand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we lost the house. We end up, uh, but there was an advantage after going through this downturn. We end up going to Dallas and Austin. We had to go to another market because the Houston market went from 30,000 housing starts down to six in like six months. So just a huge uh, retraction. And the only way you could be successful was to be in a different marketplace. So I went and did that, and, and, um, and we were able to start growing the, the company back again. But I remember I kind of said, God, give me one more boom, and I won't screw the next one up. You know, uh -huh. you know, I know you're not supposed to make deals with God, but, you know. Well, it was on everybody's <laughs> bumper sticker. Yeah, yeah, Every, you know, yeah. everybody's. And uh, so, fortunately, we'd, we'd come back through the late 80s and early 90s, and, and things got better. Yeah. You must have some early memories of role models of leaders that you've looked up to and maybe influenced the way you lead. Do you, do you have anybody that comes to mind? Uh, uh, first and foremost is my father. He was, he was a, a great man and, and a... I'm not, I don't know, I don't look, look at him as a leader as much as just a great dad, but I can't, I can't really separate those. Uh, but, but my most memorable one starting out was my scoutmaster. He was a six foot five, 250 pound Marine. And, and, I would, and I would do whatever, you know, I would run through walls for that man. <laughs> because he was big or some other uh, reason? Yeah. Well, that too, but, but mostly because you wanted to please him. And then my, my first boss at General Holmes, I remember I would do whatever he asked because really I, cause I wanted to please the man. Why did you want to please them? Was there something? No, that's, that's, a, that's a great question, and it's not a natural leadership trait that I think I had starting out, uh, where people are so supportive of you, and you know they have your best interest in mind, and so you want to do things to make them happy and to please them. And so they were able to build me up. As someone said, they, they made you feel 10 foot tall and, you know, and ready to take on the world. And I got to tell you, starting out as a manager in my company, I'd see everything that was wrong and I'd talk to people about all the things that were wrong rather than the things that, that, that they were doing that, that were right. And it's just a major difference in, in leadership. And, and I got to tell you, I was not the leader that I was trained by in the, yeah. early, in the early part of my career. Have you made that transition? Do you think? People, I'm still working on it. You're still working yeah, on it? I'm still working like, on it. Like most of us are, yeah. Right. It, it's a very... Uh, I think to be a great leader, you really have to subjugate your ego and, and really have a servant leader's heart where people know that you're really trying to help them and it's not about you. And that's a hard thing for any of us, especially when we're younger. You know, when mm -hmm. I was 25, there wasn't much I didn't know. <laughs> when I was 30, I knew everything and it's, it's taken me to get to be, you know, a lot older before I realize how little I know. So it's a uh, unfortunately, it seems to be kind of a maturing process that at least I had to go through. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the scoutmaster and, <clears throat> excuse me, General Holmes. Do you have any current role models that you look up to? Yeah, my, uh, my, my, my current best role model is a, is a man that I hired as executive vice president uh, 20 years ago of the company. 
Because what happened as an entrepreneur, I realized that I had certain skills to start the company and to grow the company. And I got the company up to a couple hundred million in sales in the early 90s. But then I realized that I didn't really have the skill sets necessary to grow it from there. You know, because different people have different skills. And so I hired an executive vice president from a larger company. And he took the company from 200 million up to a billion and a half dollars in sales because he had better leadership skills than I did, quite honestly. I was great at design and marketing and kind of the vision for the business, but he had skills that I didn't have. Mm. And so sometimes the best thing you can do is to go, you know, get yourself with people that, that can have complementary skills to allow the organization to move to a place that I couldn't take it. And, and he's just an awesome leader, and right now I can tell you we wouldn't be where we, where mm -hmm. we are today without him. You've got to have the complementary skills, I agree completely. Right. Do you sense leadership's a team sport? In that sense, it, it 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 really is. If you know you don't have the skills yourself, <laughs> okay, yeah. So some people the, are in denial though about what right, they have and don't, what they right. don't have. Yeah. You you said there are three things that have helped you become a better leader: um, know your strengths, partner, and focus. Can you say more about that? Uh, well, yeah, I kind of explained uh, the knowing your strengths part and. For some reason, as human beings, as we're kind of growing up and all, we think we have to be great at everything, and we kind of judge ourselves based upon how good we are, or there's somebody else that's smarter in class, or somebody else that, you know, can do the math quicker, or somebody else is better on their feet speaking, or, and, and you know, I, like most of us, have a tendency to judge myself by the best traits of other people, and I usually, we usually don't see our own best traits, you know, and so... It's, it's a matter of getting to know yourself well enough to where you can really see your strengths and understand them and then play to those strengths. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of when you talk about are people happy in their jobs or are they happy in life, I think it, success has everything to do with doing what you do well and what you enjoy. And if we do what we enjoy, we will be very successful <laughs> and we'll enjoy going to work every day and we'll enjoy our life. And so to me, knowing your strengths is, is a key, key component. Yeah, absolutely. And then when I say partner, it's not necessarily partner with somebody in a business sense. It's, it's more fine folks that have those complementary skills to yours and work with them to reach whatever your goals are. Just like if there's a class project, you know, okay, I'll, I'll be the presenter. Somebody else will be the researcher. Somebody else will do this. I mean, work with people that have skills that you don't have. And then what was the last one I said? Focus. <laughs> Focus. Focus, yeah. Oh. See, I, see there, I, obviously I, I wasn't focusing. <laughs> see, see to, to me, the focus part, especially if you're, not, if you're an entrepreneur and, and, you're, and you have a tendency to, to think about different things, it can really be a, a distraction and, and keep you from success because you kind of bounce from item to item and you don't really take a certain set of goals and drive towards those set of goals. And so to me, focus is, is really critical. And it's especially critical for me because I have a tendency to like a lot of variety and you know, I have fun thinking about different things and doing different things. But if I don't focus and have clear goals and clear metrics on where I want to go and where I want to take the company, then, then I won't reach those ultimate goals. Do you have people to help you with that in the, in uh, the firm? Or? You know, in addition to my wife. When your assistant? Yes, no, yes, 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 yeah. I do. You do? I, I okay. surround my okay. people with the folks that help me. Well, you said the, your major success early on was money. Right. So how has your definition of success changed over the years? And when do you think the transition was? Transition for me was in the early 90s. You know, I'd had the, the downturn that I talked about and basically lost everything. And, and one of my greatest uh, regrets was that I'd had millions of dollars literally flow through my hands and no good had come out of them. You know, these are, these are tremendous resources and I hadn't done anything, there hadn't been any good. They'd kind of come and gone. And so I, I was serious when I said, kind of said, you know, God, if you somehow allow me to be successful again, I'll, I'll be a better steward of your resources. And so in the early 90s, um, one of the reasons why I hired that executive vice president uh, that I spoke about was I made the decision that kind of once I reached a certain level of financial success, that I was going to give half my time and half my income to charity, okay? And so I've been doing that since 1992, for 20 years now. And to do that, I had to get somebody to help run the company, and so I did that. And I started learning about nonprofit work and boards and all kinds of things, and I've probably been on you know, 10 or 15 boards and been chairman of five or six and learned a lot about that whole different nonprofit community. And, uh, and, and again, found out where I could be uh, strongest with them in strategic issues and where I could help them the most. And I find great joy out of working mm -hmm. with, with those various groups. And, and, you know, you work with a nonprofit group and you work with folks that are normally really fabulous in 
the program or, or the specifics with what they do, but oftentimes they have holes in, in, in their uh, skill set and maybe growing the business or scaling it or doing things that I've got some experience in. Mm -hmm. So I love to get involved and help organizations in those ways. Well, you've been very blessed because of that commitment that you made to the community. Well, it's been joyful. That, that you're still making. Yep. Yeah. It's been fun. There's been a lot of joy in it for you? I mean, it, yeah, I kind of, you know, for a while I was really guilty about my success. You know, you know, why me, Lord? Why, why? You know, I, I know my own nature and I know my sinful nature. I know who I am, you know, and why me? And so I was kind of guilty about it. And, uh, and then, then I kind of turned around. I came to a situation of gratitude and said, for whatever reason, the Lord made his choice. And <laughs> he chose to give me whatever skills I have and chose to give me whatever resources I have. And so for some reason, I, I just got a great sense of gratitude. And, and then when I, when I, from that gratitude, I can't help but have a great sense of responsibility to do something with what I've been given. It's just natural to me. I mean, just how, how can I be, be given all this and not have feel a sense of responsibility for it? And then when I act on that responsibility and really do something with it, I get a great sense of joy. I mean, just an incredible sense of joy because it's as though I'm executing on what I've been given. You know, I think all of us individually, when we do our God-given, you know, when we use our God-given skills and you can see we're having impact, that's what leads to joy in life for me and I think for yeah. mankind. Well, I think gratitude is one of the secrets of life and leadership. And I always talk about that in the class. I understand that you hire chaplains in your major areas of operation. Do you still do that? And yes. What's the role of the chaplain? How did that come about? Well, what we found out was that, you know, we're all human beings and we've all got things going on at home and wife's mad or kids sick or, you know, ill parents or you know, we've all got life going on, right? And yet you come to work and you're supposed to work eight or 10 hours a day, whatever, you know, the, the work's about and act like life isn't, you know, you're not supposed to bring that to, to your job, but we do. And so what a chaplain does is, at least in our company, is, is they're there within the workplace once a week, they'll come by. And it's interesting how these folks that are really gifted in these human relational skills, much more so than I, they'll come by and they'll walk by your desk and say, you know, how's the grandkid doing or how are the kids or whatever. And, and all of a sudden your, your work day just kind of slows down and you, and you focus on a personal basis and it changes the entire flavor of the organization when you can have some kind of personal interaction in the middle of a work week. The other thing is these chaplains show up, somebody gets sick, somebody's got a kid in the hospital, you know, you know, secretary's got cancer or parents, pat, you know, mm. die. They, these chaplains are there on behalf of the company standing in and helping these families through this. Cause we know that a lot of people, you know, people are transient. They might not have a church. They might not know what to do. And they go through real life circumstances and these yeah. chaplains come alongside. And so it's just the fact that the company cares for people in that kind of way, puts a whole different flavor on the organization. I suspect that's unique among business in America. I don't. There, the, there's a whole group called Marketplace Ministers, I think oh. that's, that's their name, that mm -hmm. does it for companies. And I found them up in Dallas, brought them down. I've now got them into six or eight different organizations here in Houston, different companies. Mm -hmm. Everybody who I've, you know, normally it's a, it's a, it, you know, it's, it's a Christian, uh, you know, leader that brings them in originally. But I remember when I brought them into my management team, they said, oh my gosh, here we go. You're going to be Bible thumping in the lunchroom, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a bad yeah. deal. But these folks are very smart about how they do it. And if the government allows chaplains in the military, you know, as secular as our government is, you know, there's, there's got to be a, a, a real need for it and a real, real use for it. And so starting out, you know, I paid for it for all of our divisions. And I said, you know, if you don't like it after the first year, you know, you can stop it. They've all adopted it. They all use it. And it's all, it's kind of part of our overall company culture. Now. Yeah, well, that's great. Most, most companies have a mission or a vision. You say you have a purpose for David Weekly Homes. So. Yes, our purpose is building dreams, enhancing lives. Our team, our customers, and our community. And we start with our team and the people that, that work there. And this is kind of a, this, this life change I had in my early 90s when I kind of got back to my fundamental faith. Uh, and uh, after it being all about me, you know, for a while and realizing that it was really about the other person, not, not me. And when I had kind of had this, 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 this understanding and this uh, belief about it, and we made all kinds of changes uh, within, the, within the, the, the company to kind of move forward af after that impact. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Good. Well, you've been named to Fortune's Best 100 Companies to Work For seven times. Right. Is that correct? Right. Uh, how did you get there and has it made a difference in your firm's performance and in your, in your view? That's one of the most exciting things that we had. And in fact, um, we haven't been able to apply for it because we, we've gone through layoffs in the last five years. You know, the, the home building business has gone through a really tough time. Oh, yeah. And we've had less than 1,000 employees, so we haven't been able to uh, apply for it. But I just found out yesterday that we were named one of the Houston Chronicles, you know, best places to work, whatever. So Congratulations. We're, yeah, Good. thanks. We're doing it on, on, the level, on the level we can. But uh, the important thing for me in that was it meant that I'd gone personally from, it, from the company's culture being all about making money for David. And I never understood why people didn't get that excited making money for me. I just, <laughs> it, it just it surprised me why that didn't motivate people, but for, it just didn't. But when I, but when I made it about them, everything's, everything got better. <laughs> Everything got better, and we did things. We put in a, a very uh, rich 401k plan. We, uh, we've got profit sharing now to where we, we share the profits of the companies with, with, with all the team members, brought in marketplace chaplains. We just did a number of things along the way that changed the flavor of who we were. And most importantly, we stopped managing people from a top-down hierarchical sense to where we empowered people to make their own determinations and made it a fun place to work and a good place to work. And, I'm, and again, uh, one, one of the things I'm proudest of is having that uh, 100 best place to work because that, that means that we're succeeding in our, in our purpose of enhancing people's lives, our team. Right. And if, and if, we, if, if the team, if we're, if we're meeting that purpose, then we enhance the lives of our customers and we're, we're, we're deadly serious about our, our customers and, the, and satisfying them. In fact, we, we survey our customers uh, you know, during the building process and the surveys that were done last night, telephone surveys that were done last night, were on my desk in my computer this morning, and they're cut by a builder and by a salesperson and by community. I mean, we're we're deadly serious about that, and because that's what gets us our referrals, and we run 35% mm -hmm. referral rate, and so mm -hmm. that's really important to our business, and it's doing the right thing for our customers. And then finally, the, the community. You know, we're serious about the community. We've in the last 20 years, we've given out over 70 million dollars to a variety of community uh, mm -hmm. needs. Well, that's a great achievement. You think taking your employees to Hawaii twice had anything to do with being the best company? That to work helped for? too. We we, yeah. we had some uh, we had some contest. You know, we want to make it fun, so we had a contest that if we hurt, hit certain goals, we'd take the entire company to Hawaii. These were three-year goals. We hit the numbers. I took over a thousand people to Hawaii. <laughs> Five million dollars. <laughs> okay, we had a great time. Okay, you better have had a great time. It was $5 awesome. Million. Now it was awesome. Now we made more than that. They were pretty stretched goals, but we made it. Okay, yeah. so yeah. what a money losing deal. You know, I mean, <laughs> let's be clear about this. It made yeah. sense, yeah. but yeah. Uh, but it, it was fun. It yeah. was fun. Well, I've heard you say uh, one interesting thing is important to share your wealth and your influence. Can you say something about sharing your influence? Uh, uh, this came from Rick Warren, really. I think we each have our stewardship of our affluence, our money, but we have a, also have a stewardship of our influence. You know, the people that we've known and come to know and the positions that we've been placed in during our life. And when I think back, you know, our company started out at, when, you know, when I was 22 and my brother and I, who was our, my original financial partner, we were trying to come up with a name. We thought and thought and said, ah, how about weekly homes? You know, it was really a deep market study, <laughs> right? We, we spent all yeah. kinds of time thinking about it. We said, okay, weekly homes. And uh, the first homes we were selling cost $30,000 each, if you can imagine. This was a number of years ago. <laughs> and our first billboard said weekly homes from the 30s. Okay? So somebody turned into our model home park, the pickup truck full of furniture and stuff, and came in and said, where are those homes to rent for $30 a week? <laughs> <laughs> the, true story. True story. Makes sense. It does make sense. It made total sense. Weekly homes from the 30s. Okay. <laughs> so I said to my brother, I said, let's change the name. And since I'm doing all the work, it's just your money. Let's name it David Weekly Homes. Had a little ego back then, right? <laughs> and so, uh, and so, you know, we called it Dave, Dave Weekly Homes, and then. You know, I thought it was neat to see my name on a billboard and stuff in my 20s. And we started growing up, and sure enough, I'd have kids in school and things and in my 30s. And I realized this isn't that great a deal. All the, everybody thinks you're rich, and kids go to school and say, there's a the rich kid. And, you know, this isn't a great deal. So I even looked at changing the name to Craftsman Homes or something else. And did our market studies then. There was almost already too much brand recognition in David Weekly Homes, so I couldn't. 
And here I am today, and you know, God has a plan. <laughs> and uh, and they're, the only reason I'm sitting on this stage today and talking to you folks is that because we, we spend $10 million a year advertising David Weekly, right? If it were Craftsman Homes, you guys would invite me to come talk. <laughs> so in terms of you and your, using your stewardship of influence, you know, I think there was a plan. <laughs> and I think it was named Dave Weekly Homes, and so I feel it contingent upon myself. If somebody asked me to come talk, I'll come talk. Mm. And whether they have me back or not is another issue. Sure. You know, but, but, We'd be so but, lucky. But, 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 the, uh, but the reality is the stewardship of influence is, if, you know, if we've spent the number of greater brand, if I can do something, you know, for the kingdom as a business person, I want to do that as well. I think it's a great concept, and uh, all of us can take note. Well, we've got a lot of young people, a lot of students in the audience. What would be your best career advice for them to be successful and happy? And they're all ambitious. They're all here getting their education. Uh, the, I guess the first thing I would do is I would try to uh, really understand my strengths, understand what makes me happy, understand what I do well. And if you can get into a job in a position where you use what you do well, you'll be successful. I guess the second thing would, would, it would be to put your, get with an organization that has integrity and has values and that, and that you like with hopefully a boss that, that will help grow you and help you learn. And, and if, you, if you find that, that you're in a position that's not working well and you're not growing, get into it, go somewhere else. Now, that, that doesn't mean not to have enough patience to see how it plays out. You know, I, I know I was very impatient as, as a younger person, and I think most of us are. Um, but that also means give it enough time to really learn something and don't be job hopping all, all the time. The other thing is in, in, in people in, in my generation, uh, we, we kind of look at, at at the folks in the current generation, and they don't, don't work as hard as we do, okay? <laughs> now, that's probably smart, because you probably have a more balanced life. You know, but when I started out, you know, I'd be on the job at six or seven, and I'd get home at seven or eight. Now, I wasn't as good a dad as my son is, okay? So I, I think it's smarter to have a more balanced life, that, but that doesn't mean that if you get into a job, showing up a little bit early and staying a little bit late and not being an eight to fiver, people will notice that because most of the folks are. And so if you want to differentiate yourself a little bit by putting a little bit extra effort, that'll be noticed. Mm. And you'll move ahead because people like to see people with some ambition and you're dealing with bosses and with, and with guys who are older who that's how they got ahead, right? And so that's just, you know, effort counts. You know, I, I didn't get ahead because I'm the smartest guy around or the best looking or, you know, you know, wasn't the best athlete. But, but I, you know, one thing I learned in scouts was how to work hard, you know, and I like those merit badges, you know, and, and I got Eagle because I learned to work. And, and so, you know, most of being successful in life is about showing up and working hard. And, yeah, and Woody if, Allen. Yeah. And if, and, it, and if you do that and you do something that you love, you'll be successful. Yeah. Good. Last question. And then we'll take Q&A. How do you want to be remembered? I don't think a lot about how I want to be remembered. I, I, I you know, I want to, I want to be really effective today because that's how I really, you know, having impact today is really what gives me joy. Knowing that I'm, that I'm using my skills. If I, you know, I, I did an exercise I was in a group once. It's called a tombstone exercise, where you kind of write what you'd love to see on your tombstone. That's not a very happy thought, but it's, <laughs> it is, it's kind of interesting to think about. What would you like people to put on your, your tombstone? And on mine, it was he made God smile. Okay. That's great. And, and that's not, uh, you know, it, I thought maybe it should be made God smirk, just laughing at me <laughs> when I thought that I was in control or I could actually do something outside of his, you know, his control. But just the fact that uh, I'm still working on it, you we know, all are. I'm, I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to do this. He made God smile because he, you know, he took this wrong left turn and I corrected him and sure enough, he came back and just the fact that I'm trying to, you know, live in His will and do His ways, and, and uh, mm -hmm. I get great joy out of that. Sounds like you'd like to stay in the moment, too, though, which is always important. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm most mm -hmm. concerned about the impact I can have today. And being here right now in this place is exactly where I'm supposed to be. This is the moment. <laughs> yeah, talking to these wonderful folks right here, and hopefully somebody will remember something. Maybe not, uh, that, that, that might somehow positively impact your life, and it might be something you think about. Great. Thank you, Dave. We'd like to have some questions from the audience. Uh, hopefully somebody is around with a microphone. This is your big chance. Mr. Weekly is here. 
usually people are sensitive to ask questions, but I know that the people here are strong enough to do there, that. There is one over there. Somebody get it started. Here we go. Hi, Mr. Weekly. I'm a grad student here in my last semester. My name is Najia. I, I noted that you wrote the book, How to Buy a Home Without Getting Hammered. Um, actually, I have two questions. What prompted you to write that book? I wanted to sell more homes. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I, I'd, I'd love to say there, there was a deep, inviting thing that I, I had to get off my chest. It was, it was a very materialistic, uh, <laughs> capitalistic deal. I, since, since I am David Weekly, and there is a David Weekly, I thought that if I came off as an author, authors are looked up to, and they're supposed to know things. And, That's what I thought, too. Right, right. <laughs> and so, you know, people perceive you as being the expert. So I thought it would make me an expert, and therefore they might buy a home from a real person, more so than just from a corporate entity. And so we'd hand them out in the sales offices and do this and that. So anyway, I don't know if it sold me any more homes or not, but I had fun doing it. And that answers part of what I was going to ask you, if you believed it's helped your sales. Also, do you think it's helped your customer relationship management? Because you talked about focusing on your customer and your employees, and do you also think it's helped your industry? I don't think my industry was moved one inch by my book. <laughs> uh, I, and I, and I don't, it's not really what impacted our, our customer uh, focus. Our customer focus really got ramped up in the early 90s as I started personally making a change and understanding it really is about the other person, not myself. And if you make that fundamental belief structure, then how can you not take care of your customers in the way that they deserve to be taken care of? And after all, when someone walks into one of our sales offices and they purchase a home from us, they're making the largest financial decision they'll make their entire life. They're saying, okay, David Weekly Homes, I trust you and your people enough that I'm going to write the largest check I write every month for the next 30 years. Whoa. That's a serious responsibility. All of our team takes that very seriously. Okay, it's really important. That doesn't mean we take ourselves seriously, but we take our customers very seriously. And so if someone told, told me the other day, you know, David, I finally figured something out here. I said, what's that? He said, you know, you can make a mistake, you, you can even lose money here and, and you won't get fired. I said, that's right. But if you screw with a customer, you'll get fired. I said, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just, it's just, it's, it's the first thing we talk about at every meeting. You know, we, we read letters from customers. It's the first scores that go up on our metrics. You know, and, and we have quarterly meetings where our results go up and all the senior management comes in. The first scores that go up are our customer results because that really drives who we are. And that's part of our purpose, right? I mean, the, the reason why people work there is that we hire people with certain values and we can train them on how to do what we need to do, but, it, but we can't train them on values. You know, you either have those or you don't. So we hire the people with those values, and part of the values is taking care of people and caring about other people. And if we do that, and that's our purpose, it, it's helped us a lot through this downturn over the last five years, because they weren't getting raises. You know, it was a very tough time, but when they came to work every, every day and they knew that the company would stand behind them and we'd do the right thing for the right reasons, they had a purpose and a reason to come to work and do their very best every day, even if we weren't able to give out the raise and able to do all the things that we like to do. We didn't have profit sharing, we weren't having profits, you know, and so, but it, it really gave a purpose to their lives and our efforts every day, even though we weren't making money, you know. So anyway, it's a long answer to your question, but thank you very much. Thank you. Another question? Ah, here's one, good. I think they're recording it, so I think they... Yeah. Yeah, um, you'll you'll see as, this on YouTube. <laughs> as someone with so much experience um being a business owner and starting really young, um, um obviously you understand there's a different type of mindset of being an entrepreneur and minding your own business versus being employed by someone else. Right. Like what would be some unexpected difficulties of someone trying to start their own business and be their own boss? Or um, what are some of the things you've learned or tips for um, 
for owning your owning and running your own business for that's someone you want to say for someone who wants to start a business one day? That's a that's a great question, and uh, I had an experience earlier today which relates to that because I'm I uh, my son and this other fellow are backing some this this young lady starting a new business. Okay, and so they were MBAs, and they said, we love this young lady. She's going to be great. And, and so they came to me to invest as well. And I decided to because I wanted my son to learn some of the challenges of starting your own business. And, uh, and I would say the mistakes that I went over just this afternoon with them all together <laughs> that they'd made was they had projections that were too optimistic. Okay, you... you you think about what can be, you don't, you don't budget and make projections on, on the low side, you make projections on the high side. And so your, your expenses are, be, are above where they should be. So that's not to say you shouldn't set big goals, but that doesn't mean you set your budgets based upon those goals. So you gotta be more conservative with your expenses starting out. Uh, they also, they didn't really have good uh, accounting and measurements and metrics. They didn't understand that you, you really can't run a business without knowing revenue and expenses and what the results are. You've got to have the pro appropriate controls and business and know what those levers are that, that, that move, move the business. You know, what's most important to you? Is it, is it marketing? You know, is, is the most important thing to go out and get the customers in the front door? You know, okay, you've decided to start this new business and it's a great business and you're all excited about the mechanics of the business, but if you don't get customers in, it doesn't really matter. So I, I think the thing that, that a lot of people miss is that it all starts and ends with the customer. And if you can't do something that generates a desire for them to, to give you money, <laughs> you know, and, and, and to buy whatever you're selling, whether it be consulting or whatever you're selling, that you don't have a business. And so I would start out really taking whatever the idea is and really checking with the customers and seeing if they're interested in it. And would you pay this for this? and really being customer centric and customer focused. Because I think sometimes we can be interested in an idea and just presume that everybody will flock to our doors and they don't. <laughs> so to me, it's, it's starting and ending with the customers, huge. I mean, and it's kind of the fundamental issue for business. One or two more questions. Here's a couple down here. Good evening, Dr. Vicky. Um, so we're in a class of global business and technology. And I was just trying to see, you know, you moved your business from Houston to Dallas to Austin. Do you think technology helped you in any way to get your business better? Uh, or did you still run your business in the old way of, you know, meeting customers, uh, going door to door? Or did it just change it in any way? Yeah, when we expanded from marketplace to marketplace in the mid 80s, there was no internet, <laughs> right. there was no technology. I know you, you can't remember that, but. <laughs> no, actually we do, we're, we're being remembered that right, right now. Right. Class, so. but, but, but there was no technology, I was on an airplane. We did have airplanes back then, but it was, I was on an airplane a lot. But, but, but today, I can't over express the changes that have taken place just in the last five years. We used to spend $5 million a year in media, in the newspaper. Now we spend zero. It's all on the internet. 70% of our leads come from the internet. We have a whole new set of sales personnel that we call internet advisors that take the leads that come off the internet. We, we get a million leads a year off the internet, unique visitors. And so our entire sales operations changed. So everything changes and the challenge is when you get to be a, you know, an old guy that's done it for years, that's almost a, you know, a problem rather than an asset. Right, so all my years of experience can work against me rather than for me. So I see you guys having the world at your fingertips because the reality is the world is and has changed and I'm out of touch. And so everything that I've learned is no longer valid. <laughs> and you guys are in charge. We just hired a, uh, someone to help us with our Facebook and our internet and all these things. Guy's 27 years old. We're paying him like 150 grand. <laughs> Can't imagine. And he's awesome. His name is Zach. 
got the Zach attack. He's coming, he's, he's revolutionizing the way we look at these things. So you guys can run the world, okay? Because there are things that you know that I don't know. Now you gotta get with somebody that knows they don't know, so that's the first thing. <laughs> Make sure you gotta work for a company that knows what they don't know. Uh, and then help them reach the next levels with your ideas and passions and abilities. I mean, I, I really do see it being your world out there. Hi, um, my name is Ben Daniels. I'm a business management major. And I was just wondering, you attributed um, the change of your motives to God knocking you off the horse. You said that with the crash in the market, it changed your perception on how things would work. I was just wondering, had that not happened, do you think the progression from money hungry to people oriented would happen? Is that a natural progression? Because in the position I'm in now, I mean, I'm the same, I'm the same age as when you started pretty much. And I'm, I would say I was fairly money hungry as well. So, I mean, I just wondered if that was a natural progression for. I think the natural progression of humankind <laughs> is to have it be all about ourselves. And if I have $100,000, I want $200,000. If I have a million, I want two million. I mean, if I want, I mean, we get on this ladder and we don't stop. And we, and we judge ourselves by the world standards. And that's how we measure success. One of the advantages that I had, I got involved with this group called Young Presidents Organization, which, which is a group that you can only get into if you're the president of a large organization before the age of 40. And these guys were all climbers. And it was all about the kind of car you drove and where you vacationed. I mean, the reason I was building a 10,000 square foot house was not because I needed a 10,000 square foot house, because I wanted to be somebody, right? It was all about me. It was all about ego, okay? And it took me a while to realize, I mean, a couple things happened to me, me in my early 40s that kind of knocked me off my horse and put me in place. I got a new heart valve, that'll kind of catch your attention, okay, because I had rheumatic fever as a kid, so I had to get a new heart valve, and you realize that you might not be here in the future, so you kind of start to analyze your life and say, okay, now what have I really done, and what's happened, and what have I created, and what's the so what? And at the time, the only so what was I had a nice house and drove a German car. So what, you know? The other thing that happened was I'd run my business 20 years, and I'd learned it, and I knew it really well, and I, I, and I was getting a little bit bored because I, I like new things and, this, and, I, and I knew my business cold. You know, I had it down. And so I was kind of ready for different challenges. You know, I went on a three-day retreat with the church. I, kids were getting older. I wasn't spending enough time with them. I mean, so there were a number of different things that, that were happening. And I, and I kind of made this promise, you know, give me one more boom and I won't screw the next one up. And I kind of set a number that if I made this much money that I was going to start giving half of it away. And I hit the number. And so, you know, am I going to be true to what I said? Am I going to have integrity or am I not? So to me, it was, there were about four or five things in a row that kind of said, okay, weekly, we're going to do something about this or not. But I got to tell you, that is not normal. Okay. Um, I've got, I've got a, another good friend who happens to be a, a trustee at, at the college here. And, and we both, we each give away about half of our income each year. And we've been doing this for years and, and we give together and, and he's a fabulous guy. And, you know, we were raising money for something. We went and talked to some billionaire friends, not millionaire friends, billionaire friends. And they're not giving any money away and they're strong Christian folks and this and that. But, you know, and we just scratch our heads. What's the deal? We know he's a good guy and he's got a good heart and this and that. And he said, you know, to get to be a billionaire, you have to be, think that counting and how much you have is really important. <laughs> you know, you, you got to be kind of, you got to be a counter. <laughs> Uh, and that's how you got to define yourself. And they just can't give it up. You know, if, if you define yourself by how much you have, you'll always be unhappy because someone else always has more. It's called reference anxiety. <laughs> if you run your life by what somebody else has, what you don't have, you will always be unsatisfied because someone will always have more. <laughs> okay. The question is, are you, are you going to run your life based upon <laughs> what you're doing for others and what's important and those things. That's not to say that there's not a period of life that's more about acquisition and you want to take care of your family and you want to learn and do. I'm, I, don't, I don't deride that at all. That's where you ought to be, okay? 
but you got to have some end goal out there and understand there's something more important than how much money you have. And even if, uh, I remember at, at age 21, I went to the mayor's prayer breakfast here in Houston. This guy stood up and talked. His name was Stanley Tam. And he wrote, wrote a book, and it was called God Owns My Business. And he got up and talked, and he talked about going to business partnership with God. I said, well, that's kind of weird. You know, how's that work? You know, what happens on the stock distributions? How do you get it? <laughs> How, you know, you, know you, you call them up and say, yo, God, I got, the, I got a check for you. I mean, how's that work? <laughs> but it just always stuck with me. And I said, wouldn't that be cool, you know, to go in business and say half your earnings, go to charity or kingdom endeavors or whatever? And it always stuck with me. So I just had different things that occurred to my life that, that kind of put me in a place that said that as I reach certain goals, I ought to be doing something else. Maybe tonight's a time like that for you guys. Maybe 20 years from now. So you might say, I remember this crazy home builder guy, and he gave away half of what he made. And you know what? We have enough, sweetie. <laughs> what about it? I mean, who knows? Anyway. Lots of wisdom there, people. I've been around the block a few times, too, and I know what he's saying is right on the mark. So you have the luxury of having his wisdom departed to you without having to live it all yet. So if you can remember it, it's really a good thing. One more question. Good evening. My name is Keith Sneed. I'm an MBA student here. I can't hear you very well. I'm sorry. My name is Keith Sneed. I'm, in a, um, I'm an MBA student here. Great. In a, in a market or a business as volatile and competitive as home building, how do you stay ahead of the curve or ahead of the competition? And in an instance that you get behind, how do you adjust? It's a great question. Uh, you could also add, especially as being an old guy, you know, how do you stay ahead? Because that's, because <laughs> I, I already talked about the fact that you guys own the future, right? Because you know things that I'll never know. Um, to me, you have to have an insatiable curiosity, <laughs> okay? I mean, I'm curious about everything, and I ask questions, and I learn, and so it's about being a continual learner. So everything you're learning right here, and you've gone to class, you've done all this stuff, if that stops, you're dead. <laughs> you know, you've got to be a continual learner all your life. So if there's one thing that, that, I, that I would say in terms of what's the secret to staying ahead of the competition, it's have curiosity, be a continual learner, never get prideful, right? When we each get prideful and we think we know too much or know something, that's when we're ready for a fall, right? You can read about it all the time in the Bible. <laughs> happens a lot. It's happened to me, okay? Whenever, whenever I get prideful and think I know too much, watch out. It's about to come. And so continuing to learn and ask questions and being curious uh, to, to me is the real answer. Let, let me mention one more thing since that's the last question. You know, we've had a very tough time this last five years. We laid off 1,000 people. We went from a billion six in sales to 600 million in sales over this last five years. And so to be named one of the best companies to work for after laying off 1,000 people, that's a big deal. And I had people, after going through the layoffs, that wrote me notes and said, David, I'm so sorry. I know that was so hard on you. They just got laid off and lost their job. And they're writing me a note and, and feeling bad for me. Now, they do that because I knew that I cared and I took care of them and I believed in them. And they knew that when the market came back that they're the first pe people I'd go to. So we've gone from 600 people up to 850 people. We've hired back uh, 250 of those folks. But they knew that for the company to survive, you know, this was, this was survival. I mean, this wasn't, you know, this wasn't just a tough business time. This was survival. And, and so it was just that kind of time we went through. But we survived, and we're here, and we're heading back up, and we're going to grow at 24% a year for the next five years. We've got a goal to be a $5 billion company by the year 2025. We'll call it our noble journey 2025. So we've got a plan. <laughs> okay, and we've got a future, and we're still excited about it, and it's fun. So... We're still moving. Now, in, in terms of how, how to get through a downturn like this and what happened, I've, I've got a very short definition of leadership that, that really st stood me well. And that, that, that the great leader that I believe, has, has, it's really four words, <laughs> okay? And, and it has everything to do with define reality and give hope. Define reality and give hope. So I, as a leader, coming through this downturn, I had to tell the people where we were and what the challenges were and, the cha and where we were. So I had to be completely transparent and honest with them. 
to gain their, their belief and their confidence in the company going through this very tough, tough period. But then I also had to be able to give hope about the future and about what, what can be and what can come and paint the picture of the future, just like we have now with our noble journey 2025. I believe it. We're going to do it. We've got plans in place. So as a leader, I think if you define reality and give hope, you've got it made. Great definition. David, it's been wonderful. We're really privileged to have you here. You've given us a lot of insight, and I know the audience enjoyed all your remarks. It was a real pleasure, so thank you so much. Thank you.